It's the first video of 2023. Oh my God, hey, welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theater. I'm a freelance theatre critic based here in the UK and a content creator on YouTube where I post reviews of the shows that I have been invited to go and see and I talk about theatrical news and gossip and drama happening both in the West End and on Broadway. If that sounds like the kind of thing that you would like to see more of in 2023, then make sure you subscribe. Today I am finally going to be recapping the best shows that I saw last year in 2022. Now after a few years of subdued and interrupted theatre going because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, 2022 was finally a great full year of theatre. I saw so many shows. Now back at the beginning of the year I was seeing a few shows a week, uh, but I was still in rehearsals a lot for various community theatre shows, so I wasn't getting to go to the theatre as much as maybe I would like to. To. From sort of May onwards, I saw an awful lot of theatre. So I didn't see everything in the year of 2022, that's what I'm uh, trying to say. And there's a few things that I missed as well. I have some regrets about the shows that I didn't see. There's a lot of great plays specifically that I missed in the last year. Things like Good and Best of Enemies and The P Word and uh, The Father and the Assassin. A lot of really great theatre that I heard great things about uh, that regretfully I did not see last year. So this is the 15 shows which I saw that I enjoyed the most. That is my disclaimer for today. Now, if after watching today's video, you would like to rank the shows that you saw in the last year or pick out some of your favorites, then right now for a few more days, you can click on the link in the description and play Show Score's 2022 Year in Reviews. Now, if you use that link to sign up for an account with Show Score and rank and score a few of the shows that you saw last year and then use the 2022 Year in Reviews game to pick out all the shows that you saw, it will give you lots of information about your favorite shows from the last year, how many hours you spent in a theater, what the shows you saw say about you as a theatre goer, how many you saw in the West End versus in non-West End theatres, lots of really interesting stuff. And if you share any of those infographics to your social media, then you can enter for a chance to win a £365 or dollar theatre token from Showscore and Today Ticks. Now, with no further interruption, let me tell you my favourite shows from 2022. So I've put these in an order. I tried to do a top 10, I really did, but there were too many heartbreaks for me to not do a top 15. So I've put this at number 15. Don't read too much into the numbering because it's hard when you're looking at these really different shows. Some are musicals, some are plays, and some you saw a year ago, some you saw really recently. It's hard to compare them and say, well, that is 15 and that is 14. So broadly they're in the right place, but I'm not super exact with these numbers, but I loved all of these shows. So in at number 15, we have Bring It On. This was an ill-fated production that happened last year at the Southbank Centre. Devastatingly, it was meant to be embarking on a full UK tour, and unfortunately, that got pulled due to low ticket sales. This is something we saw for the rest of the year. I've told you many times on here, audience numbers and figures and ticket sales have yet to resurge to pre-pandemic levels, especially in regional venues. A lot of tours, a lot of productions all across the UK and all across the world are struggling for that reason. But I loved Bring It On, and I don't know that I was necessarily expecting to, because I don't think I'm its target audience. I feel like this would play so well and so perfectly to the Heathers crowd, and I like Heathers, but I'm not like one of its like really committed fans. I really wish shows like Bring It On could have the level of success that Heathers and Mean Girls have found. But I thought this was great. It had so many amazing talents in its cast. I did a full review of this back on YouTube about a year ago, so you can go and check that out on my channel for all of my thoughts. But it gave us people like Connor Carson, who I picked out as a huge star in this, who is now understudying Raoul in the West End. Thrilled for him, um, but devastated for the entire company and crew and creative team of Bring It On because they put together a beautiful show. I cried. I cried at the end of Bring It On when they were doing the whole final cheer sequence. I wasn't expecting to, but I did. I don't know what that says about me, but I cried. I thought it was beautiful. And the choreography, let me tell you, both in terms of like Fabian Aloise who choreographed the thing and of the cast for actually executing the choreography because this was cheerleading choreography. This is so different from standard musical theater dance or what a lot of these people would have a background in from drama school. So I was so, so impressed 
by the choreography and by the athletic ability and the gymnastics that they were performing on this stage. It was genuinely awe-inspiring. I did have an opportunity recently for another site to pick out some of my favorite creative contributions for the year and um, I was very happy to be able to recognize and uplift Fabian Aloise's choreography for Bring It On because it was fantastic. <laughs> In at number 14, we have The Doctor. This is a play I saw very recently in the West End, and this was its return. So this had been at the Almeida, I believe, pre-pandemic, and was then eligible for all of the Olivier Awards in that sort of mid-pandemic Olivier ceremony that they did in the Palladium with no audience. It then got the chance to come back and have its proper run at the Duke of York's Theatre. So this starred Juliet Stevenson, incredible, phenomenal actor Juliet Stevenson, as a doctor experiencing a challenging backlash and aftermath of a difficult medical decision. Essentially, this doctor had denied a religious leader access to the bedside of a dying child. And what we see in the play is a phenomenally layered debate that surrounds this, that talks about identity and religious background and cultural background. But the brilliance of it is the approach to casting. So all of the peripheral characters in this play are cast, shall I say, opaquely. Essentially, you come to understand that the race, the skin tone, the gender of the particular performer is not indicative of the character that they are playing. The casting is entirely colorblind, so that the audience is not able to form any kind of preconception about that character until they reveal things about themselves. So you have to try and decipher the way that they are acting, the way that they are responding to a situation. Is their behavior indicative of a toxic masculinity, for example, or something similar? Are they affiliated in a certain religious way? Do they have a connection to this from a personal standpoint for one of those reasons? without being able to pin it on something that you can see. It really encourages you to think as an audience member um, because it's very challenging. It's very challenging. One of my favorite things about this play was that it had a live drummer on stage, atop the stage at the Duke of York's Theatre, and it was very tense. It was phenomenally tense throughout. I didn't actually review this on my channel or in writing anywhere because it was very near the end of the run when I bought a ticket uh, to go and see this play. So I didn't think there was anything else that needed to be said by me so near to the end of the run, but it was an excellent piece of theater. And Juliet Stevenson, one of the great performances that I saw this year. Next up, we have The Great British Bake Off Musical. Now, I did get a chance to talk about this a little bit earlier in the year here on my channel. I saw this at the Everyman Theatre in Cheltenham, and this was a little pre-West End run because they have now announced that the show is going to be opening at the Noel Coward Theatre later this year. I was going to say next year, but we are already in 2023. And I feel like since this was announced, people weren't really sure what to make of this show. They weren't sure how sincere a Bake Off musical would be. And I think people thought that it was this cheap kind of an idea. And I'm here to tell you, just like I told you after I saw the thing, it was beautiful and it was lovely. And for all the reasons that Bake Off has been successful and that people love Bake Off, if you do love Bake Off, as many people do, um, those are the same reasons why this musical works. It just does exactly the same things. I think at the time I thought it would only work if it did some kind of very funny parody of Bake Off, but just by being a sincere musicalization of a beloved TV program, it captures all of its charm and it captures what really matters about it, which is nothing to do with the baking. It's nothing to do with the cake or the challenge or the suspense of people getting eliminated. It's all to do with meeting these characters and learning about them and how they bring their humanity and their backstory and their diverse culture to the Bake Off tent. And that's what's really lovely about this show. I'm so excited for this to open, for more people to get to go and see this, and to hear all your comments about how much you love this show. I think this is really going to surprise people, and it's going to be one of the most fondly enjoyed new musicals of 2023. Charlotte Wakefield gives a beautiful leading performance, but all around her, in the supporting cast, phenomenal talents, many of whom are going to be transferring with the production to the West End. There are some new cast members joining it as well, who are going to give delicious performances, I'm sure, because they are all remarkable talents. It's it's going to be one of the great joys for me of this year, seeing that show in London. In particular, there is one song, the title of which I'm not going to tell you, but I believe it is sung by an Italian character, and that is, for me, one of the most profoundly affecting new musical theatre songs that I have heard this year. 
So shout out to Jake Brunger and Pippa Cleary who wrote the score. They did a fantastic job. At number 12, we have I, Joan at Shakespeare's Globe. I actually reviewed this for whatsonstage.com, so if you want to go and read my thoughts about I, Joan, you can find them at whatsonstage.com. And I gave this a five-star review. I thought it was spectacular and riotous, and one of the best and most genuine pieces of queer theatre I think I might have ever seen. And the fact that it was being staged at the Globe, of all places, I thought that was, I thought that was amazing. So I, Joan was written by Charlie Josephine, and it recontextualizes the story of Joan of Arc through a queer lens, reimagining Joan as a non-binary character. And it's completely compelling, but it's also joyful and uplifting, and it speaks directly to its audience. The Globe is the perfect venue for this because it creates an inherent sense of community, and it, it prompts involvement in a story like this. The narrative of this play spoke so much about the public reception to Joan of Arc as a character, and so the audience in the Globe became that character as part of the story. It had this incredible set with this steep wooden backdrop that sloped down onto the flat floor of the stage and people would slide down it and people would scale up it and that got cheers and applause in and of itself. It, the whole thing was just fun and delightful and I had a lovely time. It felt the way that I imagine Shakespeare plays may have felt in his time. It felt like something vital and necessary that had people engaged and enthused and galvanized even. The whole thing was this joyous, jubilant war cry of queer euphoria. Next up is Fisherman's Friends, and I have to apologize here because I saw Fisherman's Friends and I posted about it on my weekly vlog series and I told you a review was coming and then time has passed. And I really enjoyed Fisherman's Friends, but I was there quite early on in the tour. I was there in a non-reviewing capacity. I was there prior to the National Press Night. So I had not been engaged to review that production at that time. Essentially, I ended up deciding that I wasn't going to review it based on that because a little too much time had passed and I wanted to give them a little longer. I didn't want to review it before the National Press Night happened. And then my memory of the show wasn't as specific as I wanted it to be for how excited it made me after seeing it. And I've since heard that they have made various changes to the show, so I don't want to review inaccurately. But the tour is continuing this year in 2023, and I'm hoping that I will have the chance to return this year and review it based on that visit. So that is my plan for all of you in the comments section still asking for a Fisherman's Friends review. I can tell you I loved it. It was fantastic. The way they use the music is inherently theatrical and brilliant and it has this beautiful large ensemble cast and you care deeply about all of their stories. You get invested in many different people. It subverts your expectation of what this story might be about and if you know the film then it may not surprise you as much as it surprised me. Uh, but I thought given that it was quite long when I saw it and there may have been a lot of stuff cut since I thought it paced itself remarkably well. I found myself constantly throughout the show thinking, oh, I'd like it if we had a scene like this. Oh, and then there was. And, oh, we've stayed here a little bit too long. Could we please now move away? And then almost instinctively, the show did exactly what I wanted it to do. It just made for really satisfying viewing. And it is emotional and it will make you cry. And it has a cast of so many brilliant talents. I want nothing but success for Fisherman's Friends, the musical. I was not expecting this to be one of my great, great shows of 2022, but it was. Hopefully I will bring you a full review on YouTube this coming year. I apologize I have not done it already, but fingers crossed that will be coming to you before too long. Okay, so now we have reached the top 10. In at number 10, we have a play, a rapturous production of a play called The Ocean at the End of the Lane. I had the great joy of seeing this twice in 2022, as it happens. I saw it towards the beginning of the year. Again, I think it was towards the end of its West End run at the Duke of York's Theatre. Why do I always catch plays at the Duke of York's right before they're about to leave? It's like I forget that it's there. Duke of York's Theatre, be more memorable. 
but I then had the great joy of being invited to go and review it again right at the end of the year. I saw this just a few weeks ago in Salford at the Lowry. It was my first visit to that venue and I was reviewing for Broadway World UK. So if you want to go and read my five star review of the ocean at the end of the lane on tour, you can go and read that on Broadway World. Now this is not a book that I have read, but this is a play based on a book. It's a national theatre production, which you can tell very easily from it that it's national theatre production, but it's incredibly stirring and it's just a hugely vivid piece of storytelling. And it's one of those plays where tonally and pacing wise, it just shifts. You have this first section that has a very specific tone and then we move into a completely different style. And what I love about it is the way that it tells the story changes because you have an ensemble cast that you see on stage carrying chairs off in a stylistic way and moving doors around and it's not heavily burdened with a huge realistic set. We just have these sort of brambles around the outside and the whole thing is very dark. And then we move into this other section and like our protagonist, our understanding of the world as it exists around us on stage and around him and in front of us shifts slightly because everything he thinks he knows about how the world works changes with the arrival of a antagonist character. And it's at that point that they start using magic on stage. And the audience is not prepared for this at all because the way that the story has been told up to that point is so transparent and is so clear that for us to suddenly have tricks and people coming back on stage when you don't expect them to be there in the right place, it catches you off guard completely. And so we feel exactly like he does. The way that they use lighting is incredible. The way that they use sound is incredible. It's just a prestigious, incredible creative team, incredible creatives behind this production. I'm not going to list them all because you can read it all in my review on Broadway World UK, but one of my favorite plays of the year. I think just incredible. At number nine, we have My Sons Are Queer, But What Can You Do? This was another production that I got to see twice in 2022. I saw it first at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where it was one of the highlights of the Fringe. I cried, I was thoroughly moved. I was proud of Rob Madge, this amazing person, this amazing performer, who I don't know. I don't know them, I don't know their family, but I felt like I did after sharing in this story. And then I was so thrilled that it was announced that the production was moving to the West End and I got to see it on its opening night at the Garrick Theatre. And I cried again at exactly the same part because it wasn't that it was taking me by surprise and suddenly catching me off guard. It's that it's so profoundly affecting and it's so emotive and so inspiring in so many ways that it will just make me cry every single time. It's going back to the West End this coming year. It's going to be at the Playhouse Theatre for a longer run, which is really exciting. So if you didn't get the chance to see it, I am going to be harassing you into seeing it this coming year. You don't have a choice. It's very important that everyone sees it. And I will get to see it again, and I will cry at exactly the same part. I'm telling you now. The genius of this show, and I've talked about it now a couple of times here on YouTube because I did a review video in the West End and I included it in my Edinburgh Fringe roundup, but the brilliance is that it's this incredibly personal, specific story, and yet it speaks to a broad community of people in the LGBTQ community, of queer people, of really a lot of people who have had similar relationships with their parents or a, a whole variety of people who have struggled with identity and acceptance when they were younger. And this story transcends the boundaries of its specificities to speak to everyone in that auditorium so impactfully. What Rob Madge has created here is just so, so meaningful to the queer community and it's a beautiful gift of a show. In at number eight, we have another beautifully queer show with amazing trans-inclusive casting. This was Hedvig and the Angry Inch. I saw it at home in Manchester, but I believe the production originated at Leeds Playhouse. Sadly, it did not go on to play at any future venues, nor has any future life for this production been announced, but I would be shocked if we don't see it again because it was so, so good. Hedvig hasn't been produced in the UK to the same extent that it has been on Broadway. We have seen it in London before, but not as uh, repeatedly. And a part of me wonders if it's just because we haven't had the right star in London who could be Hedvig and enter Davina De Campo, alumnus of the first season of RuPaul's Drag Race UK and alumnus of the stage and veteran drag performer. 
Davina is incredible in this show, or should I say was incredible in this show and was a perfect Hedvig. Just all of the narcissism and the ego and the self-indulgence and the diva attitude and the rock vocals to back it up and the presence and the warmth and the comedy and the accent and the aesthetic. It was all exactly how you've imagined Hedvig if you've ever seen the show or if you know of the show, but still with an element of Davina in it as well. Davina brought so much of themselves to that role while still transforming completely into this very specific character. And alongside her, Elijah was incredible as Yitzhak. This is very much an undersung role in this show, but such an incredible performance that it went on to win Elijah a stage debut award, which is not easy to come by. But the set design was brilliant and meaningful, and it had this other little room that Hedvig moved away into. The whole thing was striking and a little bit unnerving at times. I've been a fan of this musical for a long time and I've watched various different versions and listened to it a lot and I had never had the chance to see it live. I'd watched the professionally filmed version with the original star John Cameron Mitchell and I'd watched the film adaptation but this was my first time seeing it live and I was so, so thrilled. So this is also my official campaign to get that revival of Hedvig and the Angry Inch to a London theatre or to do more of a tour in the next year, or to get it to the Soho Theatre, maybe. That would be a great venue for this. Just anyway, this production needs some kind of a future life with that cast because more people need to enjoy it. At number seven, this is one I really didn't see coming, but I have scarcely stopped thinking about this night at the theatre in the months that have passed. So this was a one night only concert at the Sondheim Theatre of The Witches of Eastwick a show I did not know whatsoever. I hadn't read the book, I hadn't seen the film, I had not listened to the cast recording. I knew that it was beloved by a very particular group of gay men. And I knew that the original production had starred a great many musical theater legends, but I felt very lucky to be invited to go and see uh, this concert production. It was starring some fantastic people. It was being directed by Maria Friedman, who is someone who I think is wonderful, both as a performer, as a legendary performer, and as a director. And it had a fantastic cast for this as well. Natasha Barnes had joined the cast at the last minute alongside Laura Pitt Pulford and Carrie Hope Fletcher and Nathan Amsey and Claire Moore, all of these amazing, incredible talents. Chrissy Beamer was in it. Alfie Friedman was in it. John Partridge had also uh, joined the show uh, at the last minute as Daryl Van Horn. It was an incredible cast and Maria Friedman had staged it so fully, it was scarcely a concert production. It was costumed, it was choreographed. They had set, some people were holding scripts, but they were barely referred to. And there was flight. They were literally flying them across this stage. It made me so desperate for a full scale revival of this show that I have been demanding every time I have seen the producer since that he produced this show as soon as possible with that production and that cast because it was fantastic. And Maria Friedman joining Carrie Hope Fletcher on stage at the curtain call to sing a cut song from the show Loose Ends was so beautiful. It made me instantly obsessed with the cast recording. I've listened to it so much since. Claire Moore's performance of Dirty Laundry or leading the company in singing Dirty Laundry was show-stopping. Carrie Hope Fletcher was fantastic. All of them so, so good and an unexpectedly amazing night at the theatre. At number six, we had another amazing theatre trip, but perhaps not quite as unexpected. So when this play was first in the West End, I was very, very young, but I was perceptive enough to know that it was getting very good reviews and excellent word of mouth, and it was about to finish its run in the West End, and I didn't quite get the chance to get tickets and get myself up to London uh, as a teenager to come and see it. So I was thrilled to hear that it was going to be coming back. I am talking about Jerusalem. Some people have called this the best British play ever written or the best British play of this century. It originated at the Royal Court and I saw it this year on its return to the Apollo Theatre in the West End with original stars Mark Rylance and Mackenzie Crook. And I understood the hype immediately. Jez Butterworth has written this and I'm already a huge fan of his as a playwright. His world building is just so rich and multi-layered and the way that he creates characters who are just completely real and sincere and nuanced. All of his dialogue is so conversational and yet 
it reaches such depths of meaning without feeling contrived. It's very skillful the way that he will create a completely naturalistic, believable environment and recognisable characters without it feeling at all artificial. Mark Rylance's performance in this has already won him a host of accolades. It was remarkable. It was one of the really incredible performances and you begin to understand the awe surrounding this production, surrounding this performance when you see it. It's one of those that really has to be seen to be believed. His physicality and his charm in spite of the legitimately questionable nature of his character. I would describe his characterization here as masterful. And Mackenzie Crook as well. He had this particular rant about BBC Points West that hasn't left my brain since he performed it. This play was quite long, bits of it were quite challenging, but remarkable and wonderful. How it hasn't been adapted for a BBC miniseries, I have no idea. Now I didn't make a review video about this at the time because as far as I'm concerned there's nothing that hasn't already been said about Jerusalem. Its praises have been sung aplenty by much more accomplished critics than I. There is no need for me to come on here and make a video and being like, oh yeah, Jerusalem's good. We know this, this has been said, it has already been hugely acclaimed and celebrated. So there you go, I'm adding my voice to the many saying, Jerusalem, good play. That's a good play. So we have reached the top five, and in the number five slot is another show that is already acclaimed, but this was a brand new production. I am talking about Lester Curve's 2022 revival of Billy Elliot. Now cancel me if you want to, I had never seen the original West End production of Billy Elliot live. I had watched the DVD. Listen, I watched the recording, but I never got the chance to see it in the West End. It closed when I was a little bit younger. I mean, I probably still could have seen it if I tried hard enough, but I didn't. And, and you know, I can't undo that. But I was familiar with the production from having watched the professional recording, enough to know that the Lester Curve revival was very, very different. This was directed by Lester Curve's artistic director, Nikolai Foster. And again, I reviewed this production in writing for Broadway World UK. So if you want to read all of my thoughts, it was another five-star review from me, unsurprisingly, my fifth favorite show of the year. You can go and read that on Broadway World UK. Now, Billy Elliot is a story that will always resonate with a British audience, and more so now, I think, even perhaps than in recent years, because so many people are facing such adversity and such financial hardship in the face of a disinterested and indifferent conservative government. And debilitating and depressing and demoralizing as that is, it does pave the way very nicely for a revival of Billy Elliot. But the cast in this were so talented, it was unbelievable to me that Sally Ann Triplett had never played Mrs. Wilkinson before because she was perfect for this role. I mean, she's a phenomenal musical theatre performer already and a brilliant actress, but was perfect for Mrs. Wilkinson. She was excellent as were the entire cast. And visually, you know, a few of Curve's productions recently, up until their recent revival of The Wizard of Oz that I saw just before Christmas, uh, but many of them have looked quite similar because they use ostensibly the bare stage at the Curve, which is vast, and it's all quite dark, and you have exposed walls and these kind of towers of scaffolding, and it's more about the lighting than any particular flashy uses of set or colour. And the lighting design for this was done by Ben Cracknell, and it was jaw-dropping. This was far and away the best lighting design I saw all year. Maybe in my entire life. I cannot tell you how good the lighting was. I feel like for weeks afterwards I was just going up to people and saying, how good was the lighting in Billy Elliot? Were you, were you at Billy Elliot? Have you seen Billy Elliot yet? Can we talk about the lighting design? I was obsessed with this, this lighting design. It was explosive and dynamic and overwhelming and it, you, it gave you that energy and that electricity that is sung about in the show, that the pulsates throughout the entire show. This show that is not really about, I mean, it is about the boy and the child wanting the dance lessons and escaping um, his town and all of this stuff, but really it is so much more about what that represents to the community and to his family and the grief that they are experiencing and 
the ongoing grief and the struggle that they are experiencing in Thatcherite Britain, it's such a layered story and that's why people connect with it because there's so much to relate to there. Now, while I do believe we are unlikely to get to see this production again, I think it was a tremendous example of artistry and creativity to reinvent such a beloved show in such a striking and brilliant new way. Now at number four, this also had artistry and creativity in abundance. Where is he? There he is. I am talking about My Neighbor Totoro at the Barbican Theater. I love storytelling, I love puppetry, and I thought that this was incredible and mesmerizing and just sweet and wholesome and wonderful. I hadn't seen the film beforehand. I have seen some Studio Ghibli films. I've seen many of them, but I haven't seen My Neighbor Totoro for whatever reason. Also, now I did review this here on my channel. You can go and watch my video about that. I did have comments saying I was pronouncing it wrongly, incorrectly. I apologize uh, because the pronunciation of it within the context of the show is uh, a Japanese pronunciation. So I assumed that I was anglicizing it accurately, but if it's meant to be Totoro, then there you go, my neighbor Totoro, Totoro. You say potato, I say something entirely different. But the puppetry in this was next level. And I'm not just talking about the characters that were brought to life with puppetry who were vividly and expressively in ways I have never ever seen before, but in all of the areas of it that started with this title card at the beginning with the moving letters and the start of the second act opening with this like flat two-dimensional puppetry scene. The whole thing was so whimsical, so charming and just sweet. It was definitely a slower pace than some theatre goers might be accustomed to. It was not a gripping play, but it was definitely a plot aimed for a younger audience that can be enjoyed by everyone. The use of music was incredible. The singing was fantastic. The entire ensemble cast and the way that they were utilized and the way that they were directed and choreographed was mesmerizing. I expect it to win an awful lot of awards this year. I also think it's a really interesting study of what a narrative looks like with a plot that has been created for a younger audience and how we ought to go back to that and what we can learn from that. Not everything needs to be fast and gripping. We can indulge in the details and we can take time and it doesn't have to be high stakes and it doesn't have to end in trauma, but we are still immersed in this story, even though it it is conducted in what we understand to be a more traditionally juvenile way and how that can still appeal to an adult audience. I think my neighbor Totoro, Totoro, who's to say, can teach us a lot about how to enjoy theatre. And then we have reached the final three. Now this first one is not going to be a surprise to you at all if you have been watching my videos this year because I feel like I haven't stopped talking about it. I am talking of course about Ride at the Charing Cross Theatre. Ride, leave the past behind you. Now I've been obsessed with this show for years. I have been following its development. I first saw it at the Vault Festival and I was like, what is this? Then it had an onstage workshop at the Garrick Theatre. I went to go and see that while we were still like just emerging from the pandemic. And I loved that as well. The material is so fantastic. The songs are brilliant. A cast recording is coming soon, I am assured. I will be reacting to it here on my channel because I need more of you to hear these songs. This was maybe my biggest recommendation of the year. It was not running for a hugely long time at Charing Cross Theatre, but while it was there, I was imploring everyone to go and see this show because I do think it's one of the best new British musicals that has maybe been seen in the last three years. I think it's that strong. It's honestly that good. It has such a brilliant structure. It's such a great showcase for its two leading actresses. I saw all three of the cast members in the show over two visits this summer. I saw Liv, I saw Yuki Sutton, and I saw Amy Parker, who was understudying both roles as well. All three phenomenal, brilliant performers. And having seen this show in its development, it was finally so fully realized here. The set design was incredible and theatrical and full of secrets, which I love. And the orchestrations, it was, it sounded glorious. It was perfect for the Charing Cross Theatre. Not every show is well suited to that space, but it really was a great show for that theatre. And I need it to go back. I need it to either return to the Charing Cross Theatre or get on its bike and go elsewhere. The show's about a bicycle, if that wasn't clear. Uh, but I do need Ride to come back in 2023 and there will be stern words if it doesn't. So Ride, if you are listening, producers of Ride, please come back. I need everyone to see it because you will all be obsessed. 
Great show. Love Ride. Which brings us to the top two shows of the year. Feel free to guess at this point what they might be. So by September, I was pretty set on what the best shows of the year had been. And yet, so often, something will come along at the last minute and just change your mind about everything and force you to reorder the nice little numbers that you'd made in a notes app on your phone. And this year, that show was Newsies. So Newsies at the Troubadour Theatre in Wembley Park, I have reviewed recently on my channel, you can go and watch that video for my full review, but I don't have to tell you again, that show is an experience. While it may not technically be immersive to the truest extent of the word, it does provide a explosive performance from off of the stage. There are newsboys running around you in the auditorium, swinging in from the back of the auditorium, throwing things, and it feels like a revolution in that theatre. They create this sense of frenzy, which is exactly what the energy of that show ought to be. It ought to be explosive and pulse-raising, and that's exactly what it is. And more so than anything else, it is a phenomenal showcase of British dance talent performing exceptional choreography by Matt Cole that nods to the original style by original choreographer Christopher Catelli, and yet has its own identity as well. But the dancers, the dance talent in this show is the thing that I will not stop talking about. The dancers are so fantastic and the whole thing is just really easy to enjoy. Now that they are selling rush tickets on Today Ticks, which I have mixed feelings telling you about if I'm honest because I want them all, but I will be going back to Newsies at the Troubadour Theatre in Wembley Park. I don't know if it has any aspirations of transferring because it's so excellent in that space. I don't know that it would work as well in a more traditional West End house, but I encourage everyone to go and see it while it was there. If you have even an inkling that you might like Newsies, I'm here to tell you, you will. This will satisfy Newsies lovers, Newsies purists, and even people who just love a great dance show who aren't too sure about Newsies. I mean, the material is not the most exceptional, clever musical you've ever seen in your life, but it's definitely an uplifting plot. And with so much industrial action happening around the country at the moment, it's also incredibly relevant. And it reminds you why supporting workers in those instances is so important as well. So I love Newsies both for the production on stage and for the way that it immerses you, I've said it, I've said it again, in this incredible experience. But it did not quite snag the number one spot. Now, when I first saw this show earlier this year, I believe I may have even said in the title of the video that this was the best show of the year. And it was July, I think, or it was definitely earlier in the year. So I'm slightly relieved that it remains my favorite show of the year by the end of 2022. I am talking about Crazy For You at Chichester Festival Theatre. Now, if you didn't catch this while it was in Chichester, you will be pleased to hear that you will have another chance because this year, 2023, Crazy For You is going to be transferring to the Gillian Lynn Theatre. It will once again star Charlie Stemp, Carly Anderson, and Tom Eden, and it's an incredible production. It's just Broadway excellence. It has direction and choreography by the legendary Susan Stroman, who is recreating some of her work from previous revivals, but the whole thing is just delicious and wonderful. It's everything I love about classic musical theatre. The show itself is not that old because it's a collection of Gershwin songs with a plot that was subsequently written around them, but it has that golden age Broadway feeling and the choreography is so excellent, it's so sharp, it's so whimsical, and even more so than that, my favourite thing about this show was the star-making performance by Charlie Stemp. Now, some of you may already tell me that Charlie Stemp is a star, and he absolutely is. He has given great performances in Half a Sixpence and Mary Poppins, and he has been Olivier Award nominated, but this, I am hoping, is the year that he finally wins. I cannot imagine anyone doing anything on a stage that can compare with the excellence of Charlie Stemp in this role. I, I'm probably going to call it my favourite musical theatre performer of the year for his performance in this. He is absolutely incredible. This is the best I've seen him in anything. His comedy, his charm, his showmanship. This makes the case for Charlie Stemp being one of the great musical theatre stars of his generation. It's a very bold statement, but I am saying it. He won me over so much in this. And the music is wonderful. I think this can appeal to everyone because older generations of theatre goers have a lot to love about this. Younger generations of theatre goers have a lot to love about this. It is genuinely so funny. It's really hilarious with this kind of a modern sensibility to its humour. And I keep saying the dance, but the dance 
it's it's so so good i am thrilled beyond belief that it's going to be making its way back to town and i will be there so so often <laughs> just so often because it was my favorite show of 2022. Now I'm sure there are many shows that I missed off of this list that you may have enjoyed. Special mentions go to Lizard Boy that I saw at the Edinburgh Fringe, Bonnie and Clyde at the Arts Theatre, Fighting Irish that I saw at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, all very nearly made the list, but not quite. If you agreed with any of my choices, let me know in the comments section down below which of these shows you particularly loved this year, or even better, if you loved a show this year that I didn't mention in today's video, let us know why in the comments section down below and we can celebrate all of the joy that theatre brought us in 2022. Don't forget to click on the link in the description and go and sign up for an account with Showscore and then play Showscore's 2022 year in reviews. If you share the little fun facts about your theatre going year to social media, then you can also enter for a chance to win a £365 or dollar to Daytix and Showscore theatre voucher. Think how many shows you could see with that. Many shows, many, many shows. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy, make sure to subscribe to my stage YouTube channel. There are more of these recaps coming soon. I might be talking about some of the shows that disappointed me in 2022, and I might also be talking about the shows I'm looking forward to the most in 2023. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>